Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Um, most of you know me. In fact, I'm George Talbot, Provost Chancellor for Research, Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here in Asia. You're all very welcome to the second in this year's series of inaugural lectures from new professors at the university. I'm delighted to be able to introduce David Peter, the head of the Department of Performing Arts, who joined us. What, 18 months ago now? 18, 19 uh, months ago? Yeah, yeah, March. Um, from British University in, in South Africa. David is a distinguished and internationally recognized authority on contemporary theatre, particularly contemporary South African theatre. He grew up in South Africa, so he lives to where he's living. He's going to talk to you about the in the good talk on grief and violence in contemporary South African theatre. He's worked in South Africa, in this country, at a couple of different institutions before he came to us, and in the Czech Republic as well. When he was a student, as well as he studied in South Africa, he had um, a very prestigious scholarship to study at Columbia University in New York, and he certainly did his PhD. Um, I'm particularly uh, looking forward to his performance this evening, because it's more, something more than a, than a standard lecture, uh, welcome though those are. I know there are various of his colleagues uh, who will be joining in the, uh, the, the co-production for this evening. However, it is he and David who frequently attend here, so uh, I will say no more. I hand over to Professor David Peel. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Provost Chancellor and Dean, Professor Talbot. And thank you very much, colleagues, for coming as well, especially on a Friday night <coughs> in the weather. I know it's not the best, but thank you. Um, in looking at this topic, I don't want to go into too much of history and contextual background. Much of it is known, written about, or experienced by some people but rather focus on a couple of specifics, which is this notion of portrayals of violence and grief in new post-apartheid South African theatre. As a phenomenon of history, the negotiated revolution in South Africa was pretty unique. Between 1990 and 1994 was precisely when the negotiations took place. First democratic elections, April, 94. For four years after this, during the Mandela presidency, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission helped entrench this negotiation. If the murderers or torturers, the death squads, police, army, if they told the truth to the victims or their families in their presence, they were given amnesty. The victims or their families got truth, not justice, nor revenge. Thousands and thousands of people's experiences were told in dusty halls all through the country and shown on TV every night for these years. Often the perpetrators had to physically act out their methods of torture in front of their victims. The country paused. Could truth really triumph over vengeance and denial? And day after day, ordinary people gathered in community halls throughout the country to face the perpetrators as millions watched on TV. The nation faced its memory. But revealing the truth did not lead to an acquiescent sense of redemptive forgiveness, but aspired to help humanize a traumatized, grieving society. I'm going to show just one short clip from the Truth Commission 
of many thousands and thousands of individuals. And in this clip, you'll see, in essence, the truth commissioners and the relationship between the perpetrators of torture and the victims. And you'll see what happens in the clip. Dave, thank you very much. <laughs> who carried their comrades to their graves, amnesty for killers is a travesty of justice. But Desmond Tutu insists that amnesty save the country from a future of funerals. This had to do with whether this country was going to survive or not. If the security forces had thought that they were going to be up for the high jump. We would not have had the negotiated settlement. That is the price that has to be paid. And yes, the victims, the survivors, uh, are probably being asked a second time round, uh, be willing to pay a price. But if this high price had not been paid, we would not be sitting here. This country would have gone up uh, in flames. Amnesty does not come easy. Jeffrey Benzine tortured and murdered ANC activists in the 1980s. To get amnesty, he has to run the gauntlet of his victims. He must face their anger, and he must answer their questions. You remember saying to me that um, that you are able to treat me like an animal or like a human being, and that how you treated me depended on whether I cooperated or not. I can't remember correctly, sir, but I would concede on that, sir. Um, can I then also just ask you to remember that while I was laying on the ground, that somebody inserted a metal rod into my anus and next to it and shot me. I deny it and Mr. Forbes, if I'm denying this, then one of us two are lying. You personally have to be reprimanded. Your power and big person. You remember? It's difficult to remember, sir. It's not true that you and Corson assaulted me throughout the trip. I would concede that in all probability, I did. I don't know how I In the new South Africa, this man is now Jeff Benzine's boss. I was blindfolded and then the bag was used on me. I would want to be given the opportunity by the commission to see what it did to me with my own eyes. Because the victims were blindfolded, this is the first chance they've had to see what was done to them. While the amnesty commissioners stand and watch, Jeff Benzine is made to demonstrate how he drew a wet bag over a victim's head until he nearly suffocated. The idea is to reenact the torture so that it will never be part of the new South Africa. What, what kind of man? uses a method like this one of the wet bag to people, to other human beings repeatedly and listening to those moans and cries and groans uh, and taking each of those people very near to their deaths. What kind of man is that? Not only you have asked me that question. I, I, Jeff Benzine, have asked myself that question to such an extent that I have voluntarily approached psychiatrists to have myself evaluated to find out what, what type of person am I. There was a stage when this whole scene was going on, that I thought I was losing my mind.
Thanks, Dave. This is just one very, very tiny example <coughs> of the experiences portrayed on television or not on television for uh, four years throughout the entire country, affecting thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I don't want to go into the, the debates around our role as an audience, watching this on TV or watching this now or at any time. Voyeurs, spectators, or what? Also, this is not the time or place to go into the debates as to whether the Truth Commission halted or delayed a civil war. I want to look at it in terms of how the Truth Commission was fundamental in that period between apartheid and post-apartheid. And secondly, how it influenced theater as theatre moved from protest against injustice to bring about a focus on memory, otherness, stereotype, identity, current social themes and new aesthetic forms in post-apartheid South African theatre. And also how, it, as you see here, identities were inverted through the reenacting of memory and how role in structures of power reversed. He is now the torturer's boss. And how the commission changed the notions of identity construction, not only in theater, but in the country. To paraphrase Stuart Hall, identity is in constant production. This implies there never was a Garden of Eden period. Identity is seen more as a dialectics of continual evolution, ceaselessly changing as the narrative of historical, cultural forces change, the post-colonial story being one. And this idea of, of production of identity, central to post-colonial discourse, in how we reimagine history under the fading supremacy of the colonial legacy and apartheid legacy, of ideologically arranged binaries. The binaries of superior, inferior, civilized, primitive, master, servant. And how these binaries lead to the construction of identity in society and in theater, obviously to stereotypes and what that implies for a culture. As opposed to the Hegelian notions of understanding difference and where Hegel argues against the binary, us and them, me and you, I and they, etc. And how that links to a breakdown of a stereotype perception of an other. The binaries of colonial and post-colonial eras themselves fade as they are seen as an ideological structuring of history, rather than how historical forces collide and shift endlessly. And this is captured in knowing that the post-colonial era obviously does not begin on a date of national independence or democratic election. As Stuart Hall might suggest, these eras themselves are in a state of constant production. It is when these eras do collide that the inherited philosophical notion of the binary is destabilized. This is when creative collisions, not only in theater, but in a culture, when creative collisions are seen to be at the core of identity and hybridity, perhaps a deferred dream. <coughs> Within this paradigm, I will look at some post-apartheid theater and how these plays focus on violence, crime, and grief. In this brief moment of the great post-colonial narrative, violence and the violent subject, grief and the grieving subject, as shown in theater, posit an important articulation of the pre- and post-revolution phase. From this perspective, a future can be intuited, the past reimagined, the present perhaps grasped. The Truth Commission and Negotiated Revolution led to theater 
exploring new ways of characters facing their memories, exploring the other to break racial and other stereotypes. Also, to look at collective and individual grief and freedom and a sense of belonging in the new dispensation. But removing the claws of totalitarianism also revealed feelings of abandonment, revenge, rage, and the inevitable disillusion with certain ideals of the revolution. Rampant HIV, one in nine. Lack of jobs, 35% unemployment amongst youth. Healthcare, education, housing, corruption, extreme poverty. Current South African identity is in ceaseless production. It dialogues with past and present structures of power. The Truth Commission was a rare moment in the ongoing story of the colonial and post-colonial and apartheid narrative. Foucault's notion that power needs a theory to prop up ideological paradigms to convince the masses was laid bare during this period. The ideological paradigm was, of course, apartheid colonization before, which acquired the binaries in identity construction, superior, inferior, master servant, civilized, primitive, and so on. During the Truth Commission, the great crime of history and colonization itself was revealed as having been embedded in this idea of the theory of knowledge, a la Foucault. And the victory of the binary construct of identity was core to that theory. During the brief four years of the commission, the binary was stripped of its usefulness to power. A sobering rare moment in human history when a society pauses to reflect on itself as grief moves to the surface of a nation's consciousness. And crime is central to this process. Removal of the binary shifts the notion of crime onto the phenomenon of apartheid and colonization itself. History is seen as the crime and the binary construct of identity is destabilized when we experience collective grief. Thus, through just revealing truth or grasping the great crime of apartheid or colonization from before is not enough. It is the collective experience of grief, as we see in the DVDs, that ultimately collapses the binary from identity construction and opens the door to the possibility of breaking stereotypes and a possibility of a new way of understanding otherness. This also means that it's a time when people see they've all been white and black in the country, all been complicit in a process of centuries of, colon of criminalization, how they've all been part of the theory of knowledge. The first play I want to look at is The Bush Tale by Martin Kabukai. It has a subtle, gentle, humorous style. It depicts the mistrust prevalent when two people from extremely different backgrounds meet by chance in a deeply rural part of South Africa. A racist white woman encounters a witty black man with a politicized background. She is trying to get away from her white husband who was on holiday in a nudist colony. The black man is on his way to the mill where he works and pushes a rickety wheelbarrow laden with bags of corn. The rural desolate space of their meeting becomes a poetic image which lifts it out of naturalism, which much, with much distrust hesitation, curiosity, humor, 
they interact. One can glimpse the influence of the Truth Commission. The characters try to confront their own cultural memory of white prejudice and black infantilization as they attempt to discover the meaning of otherness. This is done through these very hesitant, anxious revelations of truth and how it might humanize otherness in stereotype. Via the shattering of the two characters' identities framed by their inherited binaries. If I may use Paul Giroy's great phrase, the groomed elegance of education they received. And the audience grasps that identity is actually a fear, yet dynamic process of ceaseless production itself. In the play, this is done through the collective experience of grief, subtle but there. For both characters and audience experience it. And this experience of grief is done gently. It's a chance encounter of two characters, humorously. And it's this style, the subtlety of style, that of course gives the grief its heightened impact. And as the audience, as the characters, delve into their memories, it dawns on us, the audience, the criminalization of the entire society and the attendant binaries all South Africans have grown up with. That is what is laid bare in the play. The play is a thoughtful and delicate moment in time during which these characters try with great trepidation, humor, to engage with the racial stereotype, racial prejudice and how their memories have really been groomed in the beginnings of their understanding. They perceive childhood really is, perhaps, internalized propaganda. They struggle with their racially determined binary identities of apartheid, civilized primitive, master servant, superior, inferior, and so on. It dawns on the characters and the audience that this binary has been employed to groom prejudice and infantilization, white and black. Ultimately, this process has enabled crime to rule for centuries at the unseen core of colonization and then, of course, apartheid. In the play, the infiltration of the apartheid crime is all pervasive as the characters open their heart in the vast, empty Karoo Desert. The desert is an indifferent eye, gazing at history, colonization, apartheid, binaries, their collapse, grief, rage, and also the hint of the binary beginning to reassert itself again as power requires it, albeit under the new democracy. Thus the South African Revolution, for this period of the Truth Commission at least, broke the binary. And through the collective experience of grief, engendered a new perception of memory and otherness. And it began to be understood that this perhaps is how resistance to the grand narratives of history can be reimagined. Is history of the world, the history of colonization, as the one great German writer put it? Perhaps, perhaps not. But the play does not give us answers, as it shouldn't, but glimpses through the influence of the Truth Commission, glimpses of just how this idea might frame us all. The second play I want to look at is called Relativity, Township Stories by Umpumalela Grootboom and Presley Chenwa. Presley is the actor who 
was the main performer in the Oscar award-winning film, Totti, um, which means criminal, mischief-making, combinations of that. The play, the post-apartheid play, is about a serial killer on the loose in the township. The gritty, physicalized, harsh violence in the play is captured in a highly visual, postmodern cinematic style. Township meets Tarantino, as the newspapers would write. <coughs> Since the late 90s, South Africa, sadly, has become one of the most violent countries on earth. 18,000 murders a year. 30,000 rapes. Thousands of babies raped. 150 assaults, car hijackings, bombings of banks, businesses, ATM, etc., etc. Life is hard. Death is easy. Is the phrase from the play that expresses this. With such extreme violence by poverty-stricken men with nothing to lose, lies the sense of an identity so brutalized but revealed with sharp, dark, quick, witty humor. And this is part of a very South African identity burnt into its soul of its collective memory. In the play, crime is located in the harsh urban Johannesburg and Soweto streets of broken dreams. Post-revolution hope deferred. This is shown in the situation where the promise, but non-delivery of education, health, housing, sanitation, jobs, is the reality. Apartheid is gone, but agency is delayed when poverty, corruption, give rise to the new rage and is the core of the violent character interactions depicted in the play. For those whom the new democracy has ignored, the crime of apartheid and history from before that lies at the core of their unrecognized grief and rage. Power needs to promise yet delay agency in order to prevent resistance against itself power. Agency is delayed, or to be more precise, diverted to serve the interests of the state. In the play, this post-colonial context reflects the state's need for the revival of the binary in order to keep power in the new political dispensation. It is the post-colonial binary of the post-revolution promise versus the state's need to divert agency that is at the core of the play. With so much unemployment and all the other things I mentioned, this battle takes place in the streets in the play. As we know, the arena of contestation in many periods, many cultures throughout history. This need to delay or divert agency is not new. Both colonization, post-colonial apartheid, and many, many other periods in the world require this. And power, of course, needs it to sustain itself. But when agency cannot serve the state, perhaps due to unemployment, other things, agency must serve itself to survive. That's the real crime, is the promise of agency, but knowing agency will be diverted and the subject forced into violence for the basics of life. Freedom has brought a sense of belonging for many in South Africa, but many do remain in dire poverty. No societal space, no home, no work, no prospect. Abandoned by the state that promised. Survival becomes the driver, the driver. Violent crime, the road to survival. In the play, 
What is interesting also, it's not just about the violence, is that the violated and violating black body embodies the criminalized subject. We, the audience, observe the criminal on stage and sense the weight of historically criminalized black bodies. But by the end of the play, similar to Durenmatz and Dora, what the audience sees on stage is the criminalization of history, of the entire society, not only the black bodies. And as this dawns on us, we experience grief. And it's this grief that enables us to experience the breakdown of those colonially and apartheid arranged binaries. The third play I want to touch on is Hallelujah by Nkosi, my apologies, my <laughs> I need some water, thank you. Nkolisi Norman. And in the author's own phrase, it is the play black audiences in South Africa hate to love. The narrative follows the ordinary lives of one black family. We experience them at home and in a jazz club in the huge sprawling township of millions in Soweto, which is right next to Johannesburg, which in itself has about six million. But within this story of family life, love, and generation conflict lies a vision of life full of vivid personal experiences forged in the death throes of apartheid, but discovering that the new structures of power have still left many abandoned. The Truth Commission's theme of trying to humanize the brutality burning in the very South African collective memory can be felt as the character's humanity, wit, and compassion emerge to try and to transcend their horrific past. But the true power of the play occurs in a moment of great dramatic irony. And in theater, irony is our business. And just as we are drawn into the warmth of the character's humanity, they fall prey to the random murderous violence engulfing the country. Central to the play is the haunting township jazz music that is played live on stage. Paradoxically, as we are drawn deeper into the daily fear of murder South Africans live with, the music inspires us by incorporating traditional Kosen music within an urban jazz township sound. And I would like to invite my colleague Nkolisi to share with us some of the music that he wrote for the play and composed, if you would. Thank you. Let's 
All South African theatre, by the way, always has music, always has bodies dancing or moving and singing. I've hardly ever seen a South African play without that. And that's why we incorporated music at the beginning and in Kholisi's music now. In terms of Hallelujah, the play, we hear the blues and jazz sounds coming from the memories of a Kosa pastoral past that perhaps can counter the harsh landscape of Johannesburg and Soweto. The singing, evocative chanting, invests the singer and the audience with a kind of hope, perhaps illusory, perhaps not. As they struggle in the rough post-revolution times, audience and characters do find a kind of solace in the jazz. Living between the new freedom and fear, the characters in the play live out their hopes. But we see how idealistic euphoria contains the seed of its murderous past. As the author puts it, I wanted to explore the silences in the euphoria of the new democracy. In the play, the murder, the murder is random, without motivation. So the characters start to see criminality in lovers, family, society, all are potential criminals. Realistic fear blurs into creeping paranoia. Eventually the one murder makes the entire township implode. What the audience sees on stage finally is the criminalization of history of otherness, binaries and the present post-apartheid dispensation. But after the murder, the victory of the binary is briefly lifted. In this moment, audience grief ensues, and grief is when the criminalization of society is revealed. Grief is required to enable the destruction of that philosophical binary. And for the audience, a dawning realization of the great crime of history. In my own play, Armed Response, written with Martina Grilla, the play follows a German photographer who arrives in post-apartheid South Africa to do an assignment in Johannesburg and Soweto. Free-spirited, she meets Vusi, who works for the Armed Response private security company. Wussy is a streetwise township man whose friends are gangsters who also work, of course, for the company. As she meets her neighbors, corrupt police, gangsters, certain strange, frightening things happen to her. And she succumbs to, omni to the omnipresent fear of being murdered in liberated South Africa. 
The play's existential themes of freedom and fear in the new democracy are located in the context of the massive privatization of security in South Africa. Armed private security guards outnumber police by five to one. 600,000 armed private security men. About 130, 140,000 police. It's a multi-billion global business. Every home, every place of work, every public, every private space has got high walls, electric fences, panic buttons, guns. Of course, for those who can afford it. So what does happen when, po when policing is privatized? For these companies, no crime means no profit. No business, no profit. Crime does pay. When security is privatized, police are bought off, given their low salaries. By this new mass-scale business, criminalization has new clothes. New binaries are arranged. The gleam, as Fanon might have said, the gleam of the new civilized primitive, the criminalized black body, are resurrected. A binary is reborn and grief relegated to a future where this binary perhaps itself will one day implode. The premise of the play is the privatization of security and its motive of profit, not what we might assume would be the motive of police. Within this context, we explore characters as ordinary people caught in the dilemma of trying to distinguish between valid fear and paranoia. And at this moment, I would like to invite and thank my colleagues, Emma, Lena, and Claire, who are part of the department, um, to perform, to read a certain scene from the play, just to give you a tiny taste. If I could ask you to come up, please. Thank you. If I could just say before they begin, Lena in the middle plays Anna, the German photographer. Emma on the far right is the white socialite, socialite, very, very uh, high up, upper class. And Claire is Lerato, um, the black celebrity soap opera star. And they've been invited to Lena's place to uh, Anna, the photographer's place, for some tea and cakes. The one other point to mention is that they mention Hillbrow, which in Johannesburg, in the center of the city, is probably the center of most crime and where it emanates from in the country. High-rise buildings, and the most every crime you can imagine. Thank you. Welcome to Wall Street, Anna. It's cool to have a real European as my next door neighbor. And one who invites us for cake? This never happens in Greenside. Or anywhere in Joburg. So you're German? Well, actually. My brother just got back from traveling through Europe, hitched everywhere. Said the Germans were really friendly. Germans and Greeks. I had this Greek boyfriend once last year. Friendly isn't the word. He was fire. <laughs> where is he now? Oh, back in fuck knows where bliss. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Another piece of cake? No, thanks. I have to watch my figure for the shooting. Shooting? Lorato is a famous TV actress. Honest standard. Most popular soap in the country? Sorry, never heard of it. You haven't? No. More champagne? Yes, thanks. Is this a photo of Hilbra? Oh, tiny baby in a shoebox. Yes, I took this yesterday. A shoebox, let's see. Oh, that place is full of slimy Nigerians, filthy Zimbabweans. Who did you go with? Went on my own. What? You can't be serious. You were lucky. Just don't ever do that again, please. You can't just go to those places. Anywhere. You have to be so careful. Just the other day, 
My friend stopped at a stop street. Some guy smashes the window, tries to grab her cell phone. She holds on to it, so he bites her hand. Can you believe it? Bites her hand. There's so much of it happening everywhere. I'm a very cautious person. Last week, I'm driving home. When I check my rear view mirror, someone's following me. I'm sure of it, so I'm thinking fast. Don't go into the driveway, drive past. Get on the highway, only get off at Midrand and head straight for the mall. I get to the mall and there's been some big robbery bank or something. Everyone's going crazy, but I go to my hairdresser, Luigi. He's Greek, I think, or, or maybe Italian. Anyway, you'll get to meet him. Everyone goes to Luigi. He's the best. Knows all the latest styles. Don't worry, he does ordinary people, not just celebrities. <laughs> This woman I work with, her sister was hijacked just last month. They locked her in the boot. Drove around forever. She thought it was the end. After a few hours, they dumped her on the side of the road. Luigi's boyfriend was shot dead in broad daylight. Centre of town for his cell phone and watch. My gardener had his head smashed in with a hammer. In his bed, at night. He's still in a coma. Why are you telling me all this? You shouldn't be going to Hillbrow. Or out at night on your own. Don't walk anywhere. Drive. Cars locked. Panic button on your key. Get an electric fence for your house. Make the walls very high. With sharp spikes on top. Put panic buttons in every room. Make sure they're linked to a private security company. Keep a gun next to your bed. Sounds like a state of war. I never thought of it like that. There's so much violence everywhere. It's just a case of knowing the do's and don'ts. You get used to it. <coughs> Read about fencing off the whole city. The whole city? Every inch. But where do we put the criminals? Nigeria. Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> Luigi really is good. You look wonderful. I've wanted these streaks for ages. <coughs> Maybe I should go to him. He's the best. You know, he went to a gypsy festival in Bohemia last Christmas. Really? Bohemia? Yeah, it goes every year. But I feel committed to Enzo, you know, I've been with him for years. That, my friend, is a problem. A very big problem. Enzo's really good. He's got a feel for hair. And he looks like Johnny Depp. He does? I swear. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. Enzo? Luigi? No, the stuff you were talking about before. <coughs> Anna, you must join armed response. Everyone in our street is with AR. I'm not. What? But why not? I don't want to. But you need it. Why should I have to pay for something like that? Haven't you heard a word of what we've been saying? I've heard you. Then why risk your life? This is not Europe. I know that. I don't think you do. My husband's a doctor. You know what he sees every day? I can imagine. No, I don't think you can. We're trying to be helpful. Please don't patronize me. You must take out a contract. You also have to think of us. What do you mean? If there's one unprotected house in the area, the gangs get to know about it. And that attracts them. They swarm into the whole area. Like thousands of hungry mosquitoes. Itching for our blood. We're worried about you. Thank you. I think I know how to take care of myself. Brenda, it's getting late. You're right, we should go. Self-defense class starts in five minutes. Thank you for the visit. Welcome to Johannesburg. <laughs> Thank you very much to my colleagues for giving up their time to rehearse and to perform. Much appreciated. Um, so, in a sense, I mean, this is one scene from the whole play, <coughs> but it captures so much of what is going on in the country, not only in terms of crime and violence, but in terms of fear, creeping fear, paranoia, freedom, which is real, but abandonment for those left out, not just the rich, but on the other spectrum as well. So in a barely policed society, 
How do freedom and fear work in individuals caught in a grip of a security business whose real drive is obviously profit? And living in a society where criminalization is the norm, the characters grasp that Faustian bargains are the necessity and democratic ideals the dream. Lift the gleam of ideology, freedom, democracy, and we see the myth of Faust as the central enduring myth of human relations in the play. As in the other plays, here the characters struggle with the post-apartheid binary of the great democratic promise versus the state's need to divert agency to serve business, which is, of course, in the state's interest. Privatize the police, and one combines business and post-colonialism in possibly a new crime, awaiting a future era for this to emerge in the sobering times of grief. But privatization of police goes way beyond consumerist hunger. It directs individual agency because the fear of crime becomes embedded in individual economic activity, the need for the private security contract. And thus individual agency is enmeshed in trying to avoid violence and not focused on questioning state power and its uses. The crime of apartheid, colonization before, echoes from history in the play. But the primary focus is on this linking of the privatization of, of security with business. And this happens when citizens abdicate their security to the state and obviously the market. And this requires the covert diverting of agency to fear and the market. And this is, of course, in the state's interest. As Foucault might argue, power requires, obviously, the acquiescence of the population, certainly in South Africa. And the ideology is smart. The state, business, police are not just in corrupt collusion, as shown in the play, but are portrayed as the victim of crime as much as the ordinary individual. Business sails in as the reluctant rescuer merely trying to help the state and the individual. The concealment of the profit motive is achieved. The state gains tax on private security firms, and if individuals are kept in fear, their agency is diverted from challenging the state. Autonomy is deferred, infantilization the norm. Something learnt from the binaries of apartheid. Of course, business benefits. The more business contracts individuals make up with the private security industry, the more profit. And in doing research for the play, it was very interesting because talking to the CEOs and directors of these companies were very open about it. They had maps of the entire country. And they'd say, well, we'll heat up the violence here so we get more contracts sold. A mm, little bit too much, we'll drop it a little bit. The entire country were shown like that. Maps and a full proper business plan. Very interesting. What I did like was at least their honesty. The release, sorry, the characters realize that the Faustian bargain is at the core of all interaction in the play. And I think they realize in the play that betrayal is the bird that seeks the cage of the Faustian bargain, if I may paraphrase Kafka. Interestingly, betrayal is close to the bottom of hell in Dante's Inferno. So like the other plays that I've mentioned today, and these are just a few brief to give a snapshot of many, many other post-apartheid plays which deal with many topics, obviously. But like the other plays, 
in fact, many of the post-apartheid plays, this armed response and others, are visually composed, creating a haunting dreamlike world. Anna is a photographer, and the play evokes a world where, like a photograph, a moment of the post-revolution story is captured. Disillusioned with the betrayal of the French Revolution, George Buchner wrote, the individual is merely foam on the wave of history. In contrast, Mandela, in his inauguration address as president in 94, said, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And ultimately, for me, many of not only these, but other post-apartheid plays go to the root of this all too human, all too dramatic conflict of ideas. Thank you very much. Uh, agreed to uh, answer any questions that anybody has uh, about his lecture this evening. So if anyone does have any questions, if you can, just uh, wait for the microphone to come across to you, and uh, David will be happy for them to put them to you. Okay? Do we have any? It's a little bit dark in here, so I can't see if we have any hands up. <coughs> oh, uh, one at the front here. Carol. Your Hegelian reference, was that related, I, I kind of um, missed that reference, was that <coughs> sort of relating to the um, rule of power? Uh, it's more from phenomenolo phenomenology um, of spirit or, you know, of, of, of mind, depending on the translation. Yes, uh, uh, yeah. yes. Um, where he just talks about intelligence as understanding difference, as opposed to in the translation I have, understanding binary, and how to understand, connect the dots or disconnect, when one really objectively understands difference as a, a way of understanding what is thinking. Yeah. Understanding Good identity. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay, anybody else? Uh, yep, yeah. that's Philip. A general question because my knowledge of South Africa is all second hand, my wife was a, 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 a you know. Um, so I'm aware that, as, as well as all the, the corruption that seems to be on the different sides that you've portrayed, um, there seems also to be the quite a deep moral sense in both the black and the white population. There's a strong religious tradition in, in the white and, and likewise in the black. Is there any sense that in some ways South Africa is actually going to pull itself through to the extreme and to the people who are forced to work in the field? I think that's a really important and very helpful question. Thank you. Um, I think, as, as um, Kholisi and others would say, and, and many, many people that I know, and this is perhaps risking it, but possibly if it hadn't been for Bishop Tutu and Mandela, combining Christian aspects of Christian religion with the Truth Commission, it would have gone up in flames, as, as uh, Bishop Tutu mentioned. Um, so I think very much the coalescence of the Christian tradition, uh, you know, forgiveness, etc., etc., was very much built into the Truth Commission, which has both the praising side and the non-praising side, you know, depending on who one speaks to. But I think without a doubt that religion played a huge role in stopping what was expected, millions and millions dead, killed in a racial civil war. It could well be. <laughs>
Absolutely. That's why I said I don't know if it's halted or just delayed a civil war. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Hi, yes. Very um, sensitive presentation, uh, David. Thank you very much. And extremely informative uh, for a context that I'm also, you know, sort of a less important uh, field. You know, two things I'm thinking of, and I'm, I'm, I'm somehow there were uh, uh, some of it has been implied or referenced, but I'm, I'm wondering whether you have more things to add to that. Uh, the function of theatre as a, a, a reparative um, um, uh, agent, if you like, and there was the film we saw earlier with things like reenacted there. Um, a, 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 a lot of your commentary very much about the, um, uh, as a satire, as a, a, a reflection of what is happening, does it also have a reparative component? This is one question. And to what extent, how much is it used as, as that? And um, uh, the other um, element that I, uh, coming from a dance and a movement background, um, you mentioned the presence of dance within um, uh, theater in South Africa prevalent, very present, and, and I, I wonder how much, depending on wh what and where theatre takes place, how much this becomes, um, the non-verbal aspect becomes more relevant or not, or because language could potentially be associated with an affluent, upper class, more educated sort of yeah. group of people, yeah. so I, I wonder. Thank you very much. Those are two very, very important, helpful questions. Uh, the first one, um, satire is without a doubt the historical tradition. Um, during apartheid, the phrase from the ANC was satire is obviously a political, cultural weapon. So the protest theater of the great plays of the island, was Albert, et cetera, et cetera, were seen as part of protest against the massive injustice and the crime of the injustice happening. Um, but told through the aesthetics of satire, without a doubt. So satire, and it goes way back even before that. I haven't mentioned Gibson Kenty, who's probably the father of township theater in so much of it, which is you know, rooted in satire and body and dance and singing and physicality, absolutely. Um, does it have a reparat uh, uh, reparative function? Um, I'd be hesitant to say some writers have tried to take on the idea of healing. The danger is, of course, didacticism. But then, of course, there's you know, what's called drama for life in the country or um, what we would call perhaps applied performance, which would take that on, absolutely. Um, and uh, um, work done by many, many people in many areas, working with AIDS, health, gender, uh, justice, etc., are taking social themes and trying to apply performance to dealing with those themes with people who've hardly ever heard, perhaps, of the word theatre. Um, so for that, it would have a healing function, without a doubt. This is looking, trying to look more at, I suppose, I hate to use the distinction, but perhaps more the artistic expressions uh, coming through workshop or through writers or combinations where the aim is really to try and reflect, grasp, intuit what's going on. Um, perhaps somewhere there's a hope it'll be a little bit healing, but one doesn't know. But it's a very important and very hotly debated question in the country. In terms of your second point, dance, um, you saw in the very first clip from DVD, they are dancing to the funerals of people who have been killed through torture and many other things. And this is just one example of thousands and thousands and thousands of people dancing to the funeral, dancing, singing, funerals, weddings, births, not only the big things of life, the smaller, demonstrations, militancy, everything, going back to theater, everything is imbued with physicality, the body, the singing voice, and dance. Um, 
I think that I can, and music, of course. I can hardly imagine a South African play without those three key elements, or South African theatre experience, without music, the physicality of the performer, and the voice, singing, chanting, etc., or dialogue. So dance is, as we know it here, would be absolutely fundamental. And a fusion of styles from ancient traditions coming from the past and of huge global and especially American influences and, and African influences and South African from all over. The three go hand in hand for me with almost every performance one does. And uh, as a university, performers are trained in that way for those three. And it's less a little bit perhaps the distinctions that we are so clear about you know, of this kind of genre, this kind of, this kind of, this kind of. They are trained with, imbued with that from, it's what they're living from the age of this time. Thanks. It's not a question actually, it's just an observation and comment. One of the things I, in response to what you were just saying about the tradition, that one of the traditions in, in the West, in events like this, is we sit very politely and we give a little bit of applause at the end. And the invitation to questions usually followed, is then followed by a very specific question, which is great. And all I want to say was how much I've enjoyed this evening. And particularly <coughs> that last answer, together with what you said, um, the drive home is going to be difficult nothing to do with the weather or what's going on in my head. And I just want to say thank you rather than coming up to you afterwards in a very polite way and saying thank you. I'm sure David will be happy to uh, answer a few more questions outside over a, a glass of wine a little later on. Uh, but uh, first of all, before we proceed that, uh, uh, I think I recognise you know, almost every face here this evening, but just in case anybody doesn't know who I am, uh, my name is Kevin Burney. I'm Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and it re really is my great privilege to give uh, the vote of thanks this evening. I think it's fair to say that race relations is a well-established and uh, 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 highly regarded field of research at Edge Hill. Uh, I think, for example, at the Ethnicity, Race and Racism uh, seminar group, which has a regular program of events for more than three or four years now. Uh, and also, of course, the work and publications of members of that group, uh, people like James Renton in history, uh, 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 Jenny Barrett uh, in media, and uh, of course, uh, Vinnie Lander in education as well. The themes that uh, David has uh, chosen to speak about tonight are uh, post-colonialism, uh, violence, uh, and grief uh, are ones in which uh, he's eminently uh, well qualified to speak about. Uh, partly because, as George mentioned at the start, uh, he's uh, many acclaimed publications in the field, but uh, also as well the fact that he has held uh, senior posts uh, in South Africa and the United States uh, before joining us here at Edge Hill. But I think, too, uh, David's uh, lecture this evening has also been uh, deeply personal. And I think it certainly helped to answer one of the, the kind of questions or, or question marks I always had, uh, always found difficult to understand about the apartheid regime in South Africa. And that is the fact that until the mid-1970s, the apartheid regime actually banned television altogether in the state of South Africa. And I always thought, well, why did they do that? Why would you forego you know, this opportunity for state-sponsored uh, propaganda on such a, a, you know, a modern level. But I think what David in his lecture this evening has, has reminded us, uh, and also our performers, M. Khaleesi, uh, Clara, Emma, and Lena, is really uh, the power of music and theater to convey powerful political and social truths. And given that, I think it helps me to understand a little bit more why that apart those apartheid regimes were so fearful of television 
and why they chose to do without it altogether uh, rather than embrace the opportunities it might provide as well. I think it's fair to say that you know, all of our inaugural late lectures that we have are by definition professorial and uh, in tone and content. But what uh, David's lecture this evening is particularly given, what makes it particularly distinctive, is the fact that it is so personal and so moving in the subject matter that he has addressed. And as well as being an academic, of course, uh, David himself was also an active campaigner in the campaign against apartheid. And I think it's an indication of the high esteem in which he is held in his native country today that uh, he uh, was invited to meet with uh, President Nelson Mandela, not once, but on five uh, separate occasions. Well, we do have uh, food and drink waiting outside for you, and I, as I said earlier on, I'm sure uh, David will be happy to answer any further questions that you may have about his lecture this evening uh, uh, outside. But before we uh, allow David to uh, enjoy a well-earned and richly deserved uh, glass of wine, I would like to invite you to join me in thanking David for what I think you'll agree was a very erudite, but also a very moving and very personal uh, inaugural lecture this evening.